Rose, and today we're going to be talking about a paper called Outside Catastrophes and Inside the Real. The Good Intentions and Temptations of the Outside versus Going Inside. And this paper arose out of a conversation with Dr. Cadell Last. Quite a lot of my papers and work recently are thanks to discussions with uh, Dr. Last. And um, he's an extraordinary source of, of brilliance, and I enjoy the discussions very much and am extremely indebted to him. Again, if you haven't been to his YouTube uh, channel, I highly, highly suggest it. Um, his work on Hegel, Lacan, um, Zizek, his discussions are just magnificent. Um, but the idea of this paper, so in the Brothers Karmosov, there's this part where Dostoevsky tells us about an old doctor who confesses to Father Zosima uh, that the more he loved mankind in general, the less he loved people in particular, that is, individually as separate persons. Um, he became the enemy of people the moment he touched them. Um, the, the old doctor tells us. Um, but then, you know, the closer he got to people, the easier he found to love humanity. So there's this really important irony that's happening here. Um, Dostoevsky throughout his work is going to be very concerned with our tendency to love humanity, to love abstractions, to love things that kind of make us seem like we're really good people. I mean, loving humanity, man, it seems kind of selfless. It seems kind of big picture. It seems seems like you're not just egotistically concerned about your kids or neighbors or families. There's uh, something that seems very um, good and noble about loving uh, humanity. But Dostoevsky is very concerned that this is indeed uh, a problem. That's why the old doctor is confessing to Father Zosima uh, as, as if it's a kind of sin. Um, Ivan tells us in the book, Ivan Karmosov, that if, if, if we want to love someone, that person should stay hidden because as soon as we see the person, love vanishes. And Dostoevsky is very interested, as many of the Russian thinkers are, um, Burjayev, Chekhov, you'll, you'll see this in this, the Russian thinking, on this tendency for us to be willing to die and sacrifice ourselves for the nation, for a cause, for humanity. But then when it comes to actually encountering real people or the real consequences of ideas, we want nothing to do with it and we become very, um, we become very offish, we become very cruel. Um, but you know, there's a lot of dynamics that go on here. Uh, no, nobody likes to see themselves as someone who doesn't love others, uh, but at the same time, loving others is very difficult. You know, so we have to figure out these mechanisms of um, self-deception, these mechanisms of mental gymnastics so that we can convince others that we care about other people and ourselves, mind you, all while we avoid the real of people. And the real is an important idea that you find in Lacan. And the real, you know, a way to encounter that is you see it in marriage. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, the honeymoon phase people will talk about when you're first married, the honeymoon phase and how everything's perfect. And then you, the years go by and you become irritable. You don't talk to each other so much. You're very office and you're very mean. Um, the real comes in. Uh, the truth is that human beings are very difficult to be around. Human beings are moody. Human beings are confusing. Human beings don't even know themselves what they want out of life. They're, they're bad at communicating. <laughs> the real of human life is very difficult. And often what Dostoevsky wants to point out is that we love humanity precisely to avoid the real, as I'll call it. Um, but because we love humanity, it seems like we do love people. And so we can get away with avoiding the real while making it seem like we don't avoid the real. And we're able to pull this self-deception on ourselves and we're able to um, pull it on other people because you live in a society where you're praised for loving humanity. I mean, there's a lot of talk about how it's selfish to have kids and family and, and how you need to focus on humanity. Um, for Dostoevsky, that's very, very concerning. And I think we should be concerned about it as well because it... because. Uh, Dr. Last put this very well where he said, you know, the mind is a, a self-deception machine. We are incredibly good at self-deception and we easily use humanity as a way to avoid the real while convincing ourselves that we face the real. Um, and this is a very, is a very big problem. Um, we, humanity is great to love. One, we can make it, um, we can project into it whatever we want. It's faceless. There's not going to be any risk of a Sardian gaze. It's not going to judge us. We're just going to be able to save it 
quote unquote, feel like we're saviors and never have to do the tough work of dealing with the real. The paper is going to make a distinction between the inside and the outside. And the inside is the space of the real. It's where you go in yourself, discover you're a self-deceptive um, being that, that is always trying to avoid uh, facing what kind of creature you're, you actually are. And um, the inside is where you encounter the truth of human beings, that we tend to be pressure cookers on one another and we tend to be difficult. The outside is, you could even call it the unreal, I guess, the opposite of... Um, Lacan's the real, although I hesitate to use the language of the unreal because that sounds like non-occurring. Um, but the outside is the social space. The outside is humanity. The outside is the realm of abstraction. Now this might sound strange because we generally associate abstractions uh, with the brain and the mind, so that sounds very inside. But really, what the, the the key is that the outside realm, which is where you find humanity and, and abstractions like that that are easy to love and interact with, they're abstractions upon abstractions. Actions. Um, when I talk about being, when I talk about humanity, um, sure, there, it's referring to the collective, but it's more so an abstraction because there's just individuals in the world. Even if there can be emergent results between those individuals, no one, uh, no one ever encounters humanity. It, but though that's an abstraction on an abstraction, if I were to tell you that I am sad. Well, no, you can't access my subjective um, sadness, but but it's very real. I do, in fact, feel this sadness. It is something I am experiencing. Um, what happens inside is incredibly real. It's unbelievably real. It's what happens on the outside that tends to be hiding how we're feeling inside. It can be hiding the fact. It can be hiding individuals. Um, humanity is hiding individuals because when we love humanity, we think we love individuals, but we do not. Um, so the inside is very, very concrete, even though we um, associate it with being abstract. Uh, in fact, my subjective inside, my subjective experience is arguably the realest thing in the world for me, even though it can seem like it's not real to other people. So it's, it's really important not to um, associate the inside with the, uh, with the unreal, with the abstract. Um, that's simply a, a mistake of thinking that because the subjectivity of other people is um is difficult to to access and, and ultimately unaccessible that means it's an abstraction but no subjectivity um subjective experience is very very real um but anyway we try to do everything in our power to avoid the real to to avoid the inside and another reason self um humanity loving humanity is so dangerous is because it feels like we're doing something right and we don't tend to look inside or to notice things unless they're broken you know heidegger had the great example of the doorknob we don't tend to notice a doorknob until it's broken well likewise we don't tend to think we need to introspect and look inside um, if everyone's telling us how great we are for loving humanity, that functions as a mechanism of avoiding the inside. And, if, and, and, and introspecting inside ourselves is insanely difficult. Well, my goodness, um, taking on the inside of others is even more difficult. It's an incredibly complex um, undertaking. And um, if we are given any ways by which to avoid that, um, we're, we're going to probably do it. Um, and loving humanity is, is, a way, is a way to go about that. Um, the paper is now going to move into the problem of using, say, global catastrophes or global missions or these big ideological projects, rather it be, say, global warming, rather it be making, quote unquote, America great again, rather it be fighting um, totalitarianism, whatever. Um, you know, all of these can actually be used as ways to avoid the real. Um, because in the same way that we can use problems or, or tasks like going to work or cutting the lawn, we can use that to avoid facing the real of marriage. We're always running. Um, we don't have to worry about, say, global warming. Uh, giving us the Saudian gaze. We do not have to worry about um, fighting to make America great again, that effort um, doing, making us um, realize how difficult we are to be around or how moody we are. Uh, in fact, the people around us will likely praise us for trying to um, fight global warming or to make America great again or all these different things. We're likely to get social status, which would precisely help us um, avoid facing the reality that we're running from uh, the real. The, the problem here is what I call the, what we're trying to do are these outside catastrophes is what I call them, which you could also call unreal catastrophes. We're trying to do the, we're trying to keep these catastrophes, um, the focus of our attention that are always outside and never force us to go inside. 
Um, what we need is inside catastrophes, which, which again, this paper is not saying that we don't need to be concerned about global warming. Uh, it's something we very much should be concerned about. The problem is not, in the same way that the paper is not saying we should quote unquote hate humanity or something like that, the problem is loving humanity at the expense of individuals in the same way that there's a massive problem in these big efforts to quote unquote save the world that are used to avoid the real. Um, I would argue that religions in the past were very aware of this, that we, we love to be saviors, uh, but we don't love to love our neighbor. <laughs> we don't want to love our neighbor. We want to save the world, but we don't want to love our neighbors. Um, and religions had a pretty good understanding of how prone we are to derive pride and egotism from efforts to save the world and that we need humility and thus their emphasis on humility and their emphasis on our tendency to create pride. Um, and you know, basically what the paper wants to say is that we have to be very careful um, that we're not trying to stop global, you know, that we don't become people who are very passionate about trying to stop global warming or to reform Wall Street. Um, and yet we're unable to say, help a victim of sexual abuse, overcome hoarding. Um, you know, hoarding can develop from trauma and it's a way that people who suffer trauma can try to feel like they hold the world together. Um, and for people who don't struggle with hoarding, sitting there trying to convince someone to throw away a candy wrapper can easily make you um, very frustrated, very flustered, very annoyed, very upset. It is incredibly difficult to help someone who has suffered from trauma to overcome a hoarding problem. But it can feel pretty interesting and pretty great to sit in a room and talk with some other college educated people about stopping global warming or how to improve the electric grid or something like that. Um, you know, I, I agree with the points that the electric grid in America is very outdated and we need to do something about it. But I would also point out that it's very easy to talk about saving America by saving the electric grid. Um, it, it, you don't feel as short tempered. It can feel interesting. It can feel engaging. Whereas um, working with victims of, um, of abuse can be very, very difficult. Um, uh, solving the power grid, fighting global warming can require a lot of intellectual genius, a lot of, and, and arguably does require genius, but facing the real is very full body. It's a full body experience. Facing the real is um, emotional, it is psychological, it, everything in you uh, comes out when you face the real, when you're dealing with a very particular situation. Um, so it goes when you are inside catastrophes per se, when you are working to, you're trying to solve global warming while not ignoring the real of individual life. Um, that's very hard and it takes, and it's very full body and it's very easy uh, to instead focus on an outside catastrophe, to focus on global warming while ignoring the real. One, because it's easy to convince ourselves we're not ignoring the real. And two, because we get all the social praise for fight, for trying to fix um, Wall Street or to fix the power grid. Um, so we need to fight against that. And, in, and the conclusion of the paper is going to say that our t if we don't realize we could use catastrophes to avoid the real, then we might end up in a kind of double trouble, as I'll call it. And double trouble is when we avoid the real and suffer the consequences and also worsen the potential catastrophe we are trying to stop precisely because we don't take seriously the real, which must be part of it. Whatever global catastrophe you're trying to solve, there must be the real must be part of it because humans live on the globe and every human has an inside, a real that they're trying to live with. And so there can be this great irony where, you know, C.S. Lewis had this, this idea where if you put first things first, you get second things also. But if you get put second things first, you lose both. In the same way that we can love humanity and therefore lose the ability to love individuals and thus not actually love humanity. So in our efforts to quote unquote save the world, um, we can end up failing to help the world at all and thus not really saving the world. And so the effort to save the world then creates a double trouble, both because it makes whatever the, the real catastrophe, the actual catastrophe it is we're trying to solve, say global warming, it could make it worse. And um, it could also um, intensify the problems of the real that we fail to address in our effort to say, stop global warming. This is the double trouble problem. So anyway, we can associate the real with the inside, uh, the unreal with the outside. These are phrases that are found in the paper. And we could say that we naturally avoid the real or the inside with the unreal, the outside, um, and have to spend our lives diligently fighting this tendency. Anything from humanity to global catastrophes can be used to naturally avoid 
avoid the real, the inside. We are masters at self-deception and inside avoidance. And again, I stress the, con the concern of this paper has been how we can use humanity to escape individuals and outside catastrophes to escape going inside the real, precisely because this can cause double trouble. Um, now, again, outside catastrophes, as I've called them, are often inspired and made in the image and likeness of actual and or possible catastrophes. So there is um, so there is often, if not always, truth and reality to them. I mentioned global warming. Clearly, the temperature is going up. I've, there is clearly injustice in the world. There is clearly a need to fix the power grid, so on and so forth. Um, the issue is when these outside catastrophes, these catastrophes, these unreal catastrophes, you could say, um, are used to avoid the real. That's where we can end up. That's where we could end up with double trouble. Um, where the real work can be done is by going inside catastrophes, per se, which is unnatural for us. This would require completing Hume's philosophical journey and phenomenological journey of Hegel, as taught by Dr. Last, as explored in The Conflict of Mind, neither of which we naturally want to finish and complete and do what both Hume and Hegel would have us do. We naturally long to stay outside, but real life is found inside, then out. We have to face the real. We have to encounter the real. We have to be able to sit with the person who struggles with hoarding. We have to be able to sit with the individual if we're to be of any use and good to humanity at all. For more by Dr. Cordell Lance, please visit his um, YouTube channel. I highly, highly, highly suggest it. For more by O.G. Rose, please visit ogrose.com. And thank you so much for your time.